and Teresa know, I have been studying Bible prophecy for over 30 years. And being a history major, uh, being a history professor, I studied Old Testament prophecy to see how good the Hebrews were at recording history. What I learned was was that either Jeremiah was a horrible historian when it came to recording the fall of Babylon during the dias the, dis the diaspora, or the Hebrews, or he was actually writing down events that would. Uh, uh, oh yeah when it came to recording the fall of Babylon during the diaspora of the Hebrews, or he was actually writing down events that would take place in the distant future. Teresa, the distant future you now feel is here. Well, when I studied Iraqi history as it pertained to the time of Saddam and compared it to what Jeremiah wrote in chapters 15 and 51, man, I began to start thinking that maybe there actually is a personal God. Dr. Weingreen uh, then asked, the thing that is so insignificant that uh, the thing that was so significant that got you thinking prophecy was being fulfilled was the second major Gulf War, right? The Battle of Kuwait, as I call it. Exactly. I mean, ever since childhood, I always thought there was something to Bible prophecy as it related to the Kuwait War. But when I began to study that war in relation to those two chapters in Jeremiah, man, it all seemed to fit like pieces to a puzzle. It also seemed to fit the two first chapters of Habakkuk perfectly. And the war that followed, well, <laughs> man, seemed to make uh, the 50th and 51st chapters read like a newspaper from 1991. Roger smiling, uh, but nothing happened. Right, nothing happened. Dr. Weingreen smiling. Uh, and yet you keep on believing that this rapture is always on the verge of taking place. Only when it looks like something begins fitting certain passages in Jeremiah 51 or 49, like that like what seems to be happening now. Believe it or not, I thought I really was crazy when the American soldiers kicked butt and nothing happened again. And when Ali Mahdi pulled a Saddam insane, be, uh, pulled a Saddam insane and began to kick the Shiite and Kurd factions out of Iraq, killing women and children with no one coming to their rescue again. Man. Roger smiling. I get it. Ted, get what? Nothing. Well, I got depressed. You wouldn't believe how depressed I got. Not only was I feeling horrible that Tamadi was doing away with the Kurds like Saddam did. Hey, hey, this is Roger. Hey, I got that too. Like doing away with the Kurds, uh, doing away with the Kurds, like Kurds and way. Ted, uh, are you interested? Teresa, let him finish, Roger. Roger, yeah, uh, finish what you're saying. I'm, I'm listening. Well, when history began to repeat itself with those massacres, and no one came to the rescue again, hey, not only did it, it sicken my stomach to see our huge air force not lift one finger to stop it again, uh, my faith in God and faith in reason became really shaken. I mean, my faith in God and my faith in my ability to reason had literally been shot down by the Iraq by Iraq spanners. Uh, I mean, uh, helicopter gunships. Doctor Weingreen then asked, "So, what verse was it that got you waiting for God again?" A verse in Jeremiah 51. It's a verse that made me think that the last Gulf War was going to have an intermission to it. I just didn't think the intermission would be so incredibly long. And Dr. Ryan Green asked, so what was the verse that makes you think uh, we were in an intermission? A verse that got a verse that goes like this. Unless your heart faint and you fear for the rumor that shall be heard in the land, a rumor shall be shall both be heard one year, and if that in another year shall come a rumor and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. It's that scripture that makes me think that this is it. I mean, I feel the first rumor was the second Gulf War, the one that was called Desert Storm. 
all the wars we've had with iraq since have really been nothing but now but now that the leadership of iraq is of iraq is now on the ver on the brink of falling i feel that this is that rumor and with it the rapture is about to take place any hour now robert what what's the rapture roger it's Teresa is smiling uh, let me let me see if i can tell it roger to robert haven't you studied the 20th century haven't you studied 20th century christianity robert it's the second coming right then Teresa says it, it's where all the born-again christians are supposed to become demon possessed when their spirits are raptured from their bodies and taken up to heaven ted looks embarrassed what robert asks Do dr wine green what's this Tr uh, Teresa, and when that happens they will start forcing people to take the mark of the beast as ordered by a walked-in clone of ronald reagan who will then be known to all as the antichrist robert shock looks at ted smiling you mean to tell me you be you believe someone as imbecilic as 20th century reagan is going to be the antichrist ted smiling with great embarrassment uh that was when I first got into prophecy. But believe me, I don't think that anymore. I was only into this walking in theory due to Isaiah 57.1, which I now believe is about something else. Dr. Weingreen, went, Dr. Weingreen uh, how long did you believe that the, the theory that Christians would become deemed possessed zombies? Ted, until I discovered something catastrophic catastrophic is supposed to take is supposed to break out on earth during or right after the rapture robert catastrophic you mean like the big fear that plagued the 20th century nuclear war I, I know it sounds hard to believe when we are on such good terms with the uin but nuclear war seems to be what joel 2 habakkuk 3 jeremiah 25 and isaiah 13 are describing Teresa, gad how horrible isn't there one little thing in the Bible that is even remotely uplifting? It promises, promises you something better after death. Roger. Only if, you can be, only if you can force yourself to believe that the fossil record is a lie and that God actually died on the cross for your sins, either that or burn eternally in agonizing hell. Ted, well, eternal can be debated. Roger. As everything in the Bible can be debated, which is why there are billions of different versions of Christianity. Hey, now there aren't that many. Yeah, you're right. I was off a few hundred. Ted smiles. Robert then says, uh, back to this rapture thing to Ted. Are Christians going to become deemed possessed or aren't they? <sighs> no, 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 they aren't. Teresa then smiled. Ted thinks he's going to disappear in front of our eyes tonight, which is why he set up the cameras, which he, which is why he set up the cameras like last time as well. Ted, looking embarrassed. Robert, shocked. Really? You really think that could happen? Dr. Reingreen tries to keep from uh, laughing. Yes. And, and, and you really... And, and, and you think it's going to happen tonight? Really? You really, truly, actually do? Robert looks at the smiling doctor. Ted smiling. Well, let's just say that I'll be very surprised if it doesn't take place tonight. Dr. Wang Green, very disappointed. That too, definitely. Roger, as I remember, you told me that no one will know the day, the time, nor the hour. How can you say, how, how can you then be so sure that it will take place tonight? Ted, well, I can't really be sure, but since Ali Mahdi said that he will launch missiles at dawn in Baghdad, if the Kurds continue their attack, well, if he does, and the missiles are carrying nuclear warheads, like he said, and then the rapture will occur when we see the first H-bomb cloud. Roger, uh, Robert, why is that? The land between the Euphrates, the Euphrates and Nile rivers are known as God's holy place. Scriptures seem to point to Ali Mahdi being the willful king that Daniel 11 describes.
According to Daniel, Daniel 11, the willful king is going to set something up called the abomination of desolation. The thing is supposed to stand in the holy place of God. And Roger, didn't you say that the abomination of desolation was a, was a statue that was supposed to be set up in a rebuilt Jewish temple? I think, I think it's an H-bomb now because, well, what makes things more desolate than the blast of H-bombs? Robert says, huh. and where does, the, where does the rapture fit into all this? Ted says, Christ says that when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, don't come down from off your roof. Teresa, wow, uh, what the hell does that mean? Well, Christ gives other commands along with this. But I feel that the don't come off your roof is telling us that when we see the abomination of desolation, the, the first H-bomb, cloud standing where, somewhere in the Holy Land, being viewed on our, our television screens tonight, we should stop everything and prepare to beam up. Ted's guests, looks at each, Ted's guests look at each other. Dr. Wayne Green says, Do you write science fiction? I used to. Hmm. I'm imaginative, right? Teddy, this is Wine Green. Uh, do you find life to be, oh, what is the word, painful? In what way? Oh, I don't know. Boring, dull, perhaps incomprehensible? Well, life really hasn't been all that exciting for me. Yes, I bet it hasn't. It walks over to the painting. I noticed painting while you were making popcorn. You painted it, and it appears to be a painting of a mirage. I mean, here you've got a man walking toward an oasis that is practically invisible now. Yet, there is another oasis further in the distance that looks a little less invisible. And another oasis further ahead of that that even looks less transparent. Yet, I couldn't help notice that the oasis that's really distant from the man in what appears to be a sea of endless hellish sand is an oasis that appears to be the most real of all. You're that man, aren't you? And that banishing oasis is always ahead, that's always ahead of you is uh, are, are all the times you thought God would come back, right? Ted. You hit the nail right on the head, Doc. I mean, the name of this painting is called Rapture Dates. A double meaning being that those are date palms to represent how Bible prophecy has tortured me. Dr. Weingree, you must have been disappointed one too many times, being that you were able to paint such an understandable picture. Then Ted says, to the point where I felt like I could scream my scream myself silly in a funny farm, yes. But isn't it interesting how I can keep on waiting for Godot when Godot never shows? Wine Green, have you experienced any tragedies lately? You really think I'm bonkers, don't you? just trying to see where you're coming from. <sighs> well, today is the 10th anniversary of the accident that killed my wife and little girl. Coincidence? Then all the guests as uh, say, oh, Dr. Wengreen, hmm. That could answer a whole lot of questions. Um, that same accident badly burned you too, didn't it? Did it not? It also cost me an eye. The skin grafting was the worst of it. But I'm not sure which is worse, loss of family or skin grafting after being burned. Anyway, what kept me from uh, killing myself was being tricked into thinking that the rapture was possibly just around the corner. You think that I've deleted myself to help me ease the pain of loss and grief, right? It seems to answer a lot of questions, especially since this is the anniversary of your tragedy. Well, I want you to know, I want you to all know, that if this is all a product of my mind and not a coincidence, then I will write a book on disillusional disorder and use myself as reference. That's if I don't do something stupid like I was doing earlier today. What was that? asked Robert. Oh, nothing. I'll tell you about it some other time. But since I really feel that this is our last evening of normal, boring existence. Let's pop a cork on the champagne bottle to celebrate things that will radically come about for tomorrow. 
for, for me tomorrow. Rapture or no rapture. Ted goes over to the pick up the champagne when, the, when suddenly everyone's attention becomes focused on the TV when all the TVs in the theater show a special report sign. Bill Sh Michelle Takashi comes up on the TV as some people move about in front of her trying to get out of her way. Get out of the way. They all seem nervous. Michelle. This is Michelle Takashi in the, in the GNN control room here in Tokyo. We are getting a stressing report about missiles being launched from Iraq. Ted yelling, Wah! He jumps down on the floor. He jumps down on all fours as he looks at the TV screen. Everyone in the room looks puzzled. Michelle, we will now switch to our Tel Aviv station. Her, images, her image leaves the televisions and is replaced by the control room in Tel Aviv. Another Asian reporter is seen. His name is Dave Matsuda, and he is standing in the control room hugging a microphone as, he, as the sound of air raid, as, as the sound, sound of sirens are heard in the background. Ted, with great, with great nervous, nervousness, I, I've got to turn this up. He quickly runs over to the TV and turns up the volume. Dave says, This is Dave Matsuda reporting from Tel Aviv. We are just receiving a report from Israeli defense that seven Scud missiles are now on a direct path toward Israel and seem to be headed, headed straight toward Tel Aviv. Ted, oh man, oh man, this is it. Voice of Michelle. Israel can protect itself, can't it, Dave? Wait, listens to his phone. Ah, Michelle, Israel will launch her arrow missiles when the Scuds get in range. The arrows are supposed to be more advanced missiles, inter more, uh, more advanced missile interceptor, more a uh, more advanced missile interceptor than the Patriots that protected the city way back in 1991. But please keep your fingers crossed. That little crack about hydrogen bombs has turned everyone over here into a bunch of Type A personalities, especially when all they when we all believe that Iraq was deprived of those ancient missiles. The Mich Michelle says, can you show us the missiles in action? We aren't allowed to. All information will be coming to you from this phone. They are now preparing to launch the missiles. Uh, they're, uh, they're now preparing to launch the arrows. Ted, oh man, oh man. Roger smiling. Seems like old times, doesn't it? Dave then says, everyone in this control room must have heart rates racing at warp speed. This little spe the, the little speech about H-bombs carrying the missiles was getting a lot of heavy laughs around here, but this report of approaching missiles has suddenly changed all that, especially since it was believed that the UN was successful in destroying all the Iraqi long-range missiles. I mean, if Iraq was, succe was successful in hiding its missiles, what else was it able to hide? Michelle, don't, don't think like that, Dave. Ted. To his guests, my words exactly. What else was the booger able to hide? Guests look at a little uncomfortable. Roger, smiling as he shakes his head from side to side. He can't have H-bombs. He can't. They would have been found. Then Dave says, Oh, Isla has now just fired the arrows. I repeat, she has just fired her arrow missiles. Michelle says, Let's pray that they get them. Fourteen. Fourteen arrow missiles have been launched and are now racing up to intercept the scuds. Hold your fingers crossed. De uh, Ted pacing back and forth as he watches the TV. Um, everyone, uh, if you don't have the blood of the Lamb, uh, that's the blood of Christ. Uh, if you don't have the blood of Christ over your hearts now, it would probably be a good time to get it. Teresa laughs. Pause. Explosions like the sounds of fireworks begin to be heard. Dave Matsuda listens intently to the microphone as in his ear. He suddenly looks relieved. Who? What a relief! All the arrows were successful. Who? What a relief! Ah. Everyone cheers, including Ted's guests. Ted just stares at the TV. The televisions in the theater auditorium fade to the darkness. Uh, to the darkness they were before the special report came on. Teresa says, "Ah, poor Teddy! You didn't get to see anyone get nuked. Well, maybe in another hundred years." Ted, angry. Look, I don't want to see anyone killed, understand? I mean, I'm not I'm not some boogeyman. Roger. Well, Ted, for a minute, for an actual Earth minute, a glimmer that you might actually have been right began to enter my mind. But, well, apparently the military muscle of feeble humankind is strong enough to stop the destructive hand of our loving God. <sighs> 
Ted says, it's not over. What? Roger says. You heard what the L you heard, heard how well the arrows worked. Not one scud was able to get through, just like the first time. <sighs> Ted says. Then Ted says, don't you find it amazing that Iraq was able to even launch missiles? We all thought the missiles were destroyed. The inspectors of Iraq's missile capability were so confident that they had destroyed them all. And what happens? Long-range missiles are flying from Iraq. Roger. And they were all stopped, too. Well, of course they were stopped. No H-bomb in that region of the world can go off until Baghdad is taken. Roger smiling. Well... If Baghdad is taken by the Kurds, if Ali Mahdi is killed, how can Mahdi bring on the day of the Lord? I don't know, but Jeremiah 50, 46 says, At the noise, the report of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved, and a cry is heard among the nations. Then Robert says, then Robert asks, Is the cry happy or sad? How can it be happy when the earth is being moved and Jeremiah chapter 25 is taking place? It's not just Babylon that gets it, you know. Uh, World War III breaks out at the fall of Babylon. Dr. Weingreen then says, and asks, Are you feeling all right, Mr. Jameson? I don't know. I I'm just getting so damn tired of being jerked around like this. I really thought it was over. Weingreen, uh, are, how are you how are we jerking, jerking you around? You're not jerking me around. None of you are jerking me around. It's just that I'm getting so tired of this stuff. Tired of it. Robert, what are you getting tired of? Look at that damn picture I painted. You'll know. It's the mirage called the rapture. I painted that picture and put it on the wall like a fat man puts a picture of a pig on his refrigerator. It was, it was to remind me of the hell of being into Bible prophecy. Teresa is shocked. You mean you're actually getting tired of looking for bad news to make the Bible look true? Ted walks over to the balcony, looks out over the city of L.A. That is now looking darker. That is now starting to look dark. <sighs> you know what I hate so much about being, a Bible, being into Bible prophecy, minus the fact that it uh, scares people away from you due to giving you gloomy theories? Roger asks, having your theories prove wrong all the time? No. Teresa. Having people think you're a warmongering asshole who wants people to linger around in agony after an atomic war? Uh, Dr. Weingreen, uh, having people lose uh, trust in your ability to reason? To reason? Well, uh, that's the last time I ever asked that question out loud. Then Dr. Weingreen asks, well, what is it? Ted turns to them. <sighs> well, actually, all of the above. But the one thing I hate the most about being in the Bible prophecy, something I actually thought I finally was cured from until today, is there's a knock on the door. Ted goes over to the door and opens it. The couple that was making out at the beginning of the play are seen standing at the door. Bill. And Bill says, Ted. They shake hands. Hey, who's the pretty girl? Teresa annoyed. Girl, did he say? Bill then says uh, to Sandra, this is Sandra. Sandra, this is Ted Jam Jameson. Sandra? Ted? Bill has told me all about you. Teresa sighed, I bet he has. Uh, hopefully all good, yeah, says Ted. Bill to Ted. How's the rapture party coming? Uh, seems to be the repeat of uh, the last one we had 20 years ago. You mean back?